Okay. Before I call the next case, I have some announcements to make. Every department is manned by human beings. And all human beings are subject to make a mistake from now and again. There has been uh, a lot of uh, information passing around through emails and, and other, perhaps other uh, social media. I'm, I'm not aware of that because I, I don't follow social media and I'm not on it, but I become aware of it when it's reported to me by other people. It appears that when the uh, postings went out and the, and the uh, publication in the local newspapers that the uh, decided that the application that's before us next, which is commonly called jellyfish, that it was advertised as follows. The applicant is requesting a special use permit to expand the existing parking area and relief from conditions imposed in the previous Zoning Board of Appeals decision 20057. The re proposal would require a special use permit and variance pursuant to the Huntington Town Code. And then it lists a couple of uh, 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 town, code vi town Code ordinances. That publication was in error. The applicant is not requesting a special use permit of any kind. The applicant is not asking for an expansion of any parking of any kind. The applicant is asking for two forms of relief from the zoning board. We don't have jurisdiction of anything other than what is presented to us for a decision. The, the requirement on the removal of the conditions boils down to a legal issue. Some lawyers would opine that when the special use permit was granted to jellyfish back in 2011, that there was a requirement that covenants and restrictions be placed on the use of the restaurant, which was known as Jellyfish. Those conditions and restrictions were part of the grant that the Zoning Board gave back in October of 2011 on application number 20057. They were needed because it required valet parking because of the restaurant. Many attorneys would indicate that those conditions would abate and be revoked as a matter of law because they're not to be used anymore. The applicant has requested the Zoning Board of Appeals to make a decision that those restrictions and covenants would be removed because they have been recorded in the Suffolk County Clerk's Office and represent what is known as a potential cloud on the title. The second thing that the applicant has requested tonight is an extension of business depth. The decision made in 2011 granted the extension of business depth. So in some respects, the applica applicant requesting a reaffirmation of the extent, extension of the business depth may be necessary or may not be necessary. The law is unclear on whether or not an extension of business depth granted for a special use permit goes with the use or whether or not it goes with the land. 
So those are the only two things that are being addressed by this board tonight on the jellyfish application. Now, the applicant will be required to go to the planning board and the planning staff. When the planning board and the planning staff entertain that application, the applicant will be required to conform with all the codes, the zoning codes of the town of Huntington. If the applicant, and, and at that time, at that time, the planning staff and the planning board will entertain whether or not the applicant's potential building, which is uh, in a C6 mixed use zone, um, is required to conform to the steep slope ordinance or not. That's their decision, not ours. In addition, they would be required to determine whether or not the proposed building meets the height requirement. Again, that's the planning staff and the planning board's decision, not ours. In the event that the planning board and the planning staff should make a determination that the applicant's uh, plans do not conform with the zoning code of the town of Huntington, then he'll either have to change his plans so that they do conform, or he might be required to come back to this board if he needed a variance, in which case it would be republicized and, and it would be republicized in a way that we will know exactly what it is that he's requesting. So I want all the people here to know that I understand why you're here, and you're here because you think this is going to be a special use permit application and a variance application, but it's not. Um, there are numerous people that uh, are responsible for putting this uh, information out to the public, and occasionally a mistake is, is made, and um, we're going to do the best we can to ensure that that doesn't happen again. In the letter of denial that the applicant was given back in March of 2023, the only two things that were really referenced were the two things that I have just enumerated to everyone. So there will be an opportunity for people to weigh in on steep slope, height, and anything else, depending on what the applicant proposes when he puts his final building plans together and presents it to the planning board and the planning staff. But the applicant's, ap the applicant's request tonight is only to remove the restrictions and conditions that were only applicable to a restaurant and to reaffirm the extension of business depth, which an argument could be made that he already has. So, will the applicant, will the representative of the applicant please address the board? Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Michael McCarthy. I'm an attorney with offices at 444 New York Avenue. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that explanation, and I appreciate and I agree with exactly the way you interpreted the manner in which we are proceeding tonight and, and, and what the applicant applied for. Um, I had the opportunity to address members of the um, Centerport community at a civic association meeting that I was invited to by the Centerport Harbor Civic Association at the Harborfields Public Library on Monday, uh, July 24. And I was asked to come to give an overview as to what was being proposed and, and what the nature of the application was. Um, everything that I, we applied for tonight is memorialized in my requested relief summary that I provided to the board dated July 19, which I also believe is on the website, accessible, and, and the community can review it. Um, these things become difficult when they're legal matters as opposed to factual, you know, functional matters. 
And of course, everyone's concerned with what's going to happen to the jellyfish property. Um, I get it. I understand it. Um, I live in close proximity to it. And so the people that are here that are expressing concern, you know, are in many respects, you know, neighbors and, and members of my community. So I, I, we want to make sure that we're just dotting the I's and crossing the T as to what it is that we're explaining. And, and when we met on July 24 at the library for a little over an hour, um, I had with me uh, Neil Hoffman and Michael and Katie Vandry, who have, have since taken over uh, Neil's operation, and uh, Chris Robinson, Wayne Muller, and, and Michael Lynch, and we were all assembled you know, to answer questions. Um, the board is familiar with the record. The board knows that uh, the last restaurant that occupied the property, and by the way, the property has been used for restaurant purposes. If you read the October 6, 2011 decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals, it relates back to um, restaurant use or refers to restaurant use you know, almost to the 1930s. And we're, we're talking about almost 100 years of use. Um, I find it unusual, quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, that it took until 2011 uh, for someone to figure out that a depth extension was needed for parking. But I would ask this board, because one of my prayers of relief is an interpretation. Well, the interpretation that I don't need any relief, quite frankly, and I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, for those people that couldn't attend the, the, the July 24 meeting, but also an interpretation that when the depth extension is granted for the parking of automobiles, and I'm continuing with a reuse of property, less intensive, I might add, for the parking of automobiles, the depth extension continues. The depth extension wasn't unique to the restaurant. The depth extension wasn't unique to the owner. The depth extension wasn't unique to the plan. The depth extension wasn't unique to the pattern of development in the area. The depth extension was granted for the parking of automobiles. I might add, too, that if you just glean the site plan that's on the screen above you in relationship to anyone's familiarity with the parking lot, uh, the parking lot is actually getting smaller. And the reason why the parking lot is getting smaller is because of the requirement to add landscaping and enhancements and, and beautification. And that's going to have the practical effect of making the parking lot smaller. I don't think it's helpful to, to parse these things. I just want to make sure that the community and the board understands what we're asking for. So we're requesting relief under Section 198.111 of the code. 198.111 of the code uh, allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to impose conditions. And if you want to remedy the conditions or waive the conditions or lift the conditions, um, you know, come back to the board and request permission to do so, which I think is what the intention of the planning department staff was in issuing the letter of denial. Um, and those conditions were memorialized in a declaration of covenant and restriction, Mr. Chairman, that were recorded you know, July of 2012, uh, nine years ago. Um, I reviewed the conditions with the community when I met with them on July 24. I think the community is convinced that all of those conditions apply only to the restaurant use. I'm happy to read and go through each and every one of them, but I don't know that that is really necessary. It relates to how you use the decks and the time of parking and valeting and things of that nature, none of which would apply to this particular mixed-use building. And then, of course, requesting the interpretation that the depth extension continue. So let's talk about what is proposed. So what's proposed is to raise the existing structure and create a new three-story mixed-use building. Um, this board is familiar that there was a comprehensive change to the mixed-use building ordinance uh, a few years ago. And the code now differentiates between the renovation of an existing mixed-use building it's 19827A22, or the construction of a new mixed-use building, which is defined under section 19827A23, and that's the code section that we are applying under. Mr. Hoffman and his team, when they set out to design this building, took into careful consideration the revised parking code, um, the revised requirements for floor area ratio, um, the requirement that uh, parking be behind the building as opposed to in front of the building. I think a lot of that was really geared towards the downtown areas like, you know, Huntington, Green Lawn, uh, East Northport, and, and Cold Spring Harbor, but, but that's the standard and that's how it's been designed. I can categorically state to the board that as it is designed and as it's being presented to this board for informational purposes only, the building fully and completely complies 
with Section 198.27A23. Mr. Chairman, to your point, to the extent that when we make a site plan application, if the building doesn't conform, if we find that there is an error in a calculation, we'll, we'll redesign it to make it conform. Um, the code requires that we can't have a floor area ratio of more than 150 percent. We meet the requirement. And all of those particulars are set forth on the plan. And I could go through all the facts and the figures and the numbers, but I just I don't know that it's, it's helpful to do so when I think there's so many people that do want to speak. But, but to your point, Mr. Chairman, I, I am of the learned opinion, and I practice in this area regularly, and I have an opportunity to, to apply these codes and standards. Whenever the steep slope ordinance is applied, it, it's most always applied, not always, most always applied in the confines of a site plan application or a subdivision application, neither of which is before the board. I don't think it has an application under this property anyway because the property is completely denuded of vegetation and is paved from corner to corner. But to the extent that it does apply, to the extent that it does apply, um, to be proactive to our site plan application, um, we will undergo that analysis and we will undergo that exercise you know, during site plan review. And we're, we're confident that we can meet the standard um, based upon the size of the property. Um, I'm also of the firm opinion that the property was designed, I'm sorry, the building was designed, you know, to meet all of the code requirements. Um, you know, I indicated to the community when I spoke to them on July 24 that the planning staff is where I, you know, the director of planning and reviewers, they know how to read a plan. I've, I've got Mr. Hoffman and, and his partners, and they know how to draw a building. Um, there's some misinformation that was out there regarding the height of the building. It's a three-story building with a walkout basement. And what was very interesting for me when I arrived at the meeting on, on the 24th at the Civic Association, it was, it was a screen about as big as the one that's behind you now, and projected on the screen was an image of the original house on the property. And I did not know this and I came to learn it, but the jellyfish, when you look at it, which was Beaver Wan before that, Johnny's Steakhouse, and I can't remember how many other uses as a kid growing up. But when you look at the jellyfish, thank you, Matt, hold on to that image. That, that building there is the jellyfish, except for the hip roof. I, I learned that the hip roof burned. So if you walk onto the property, and you're free to do so, walk around the back and, and look backwards back at the building, um, the jellyfish looks like a three-story building from behind, but it was originally designed to look like four stories. Three-story structure on 25A, sloping down towards the water, walkout basement. Comparable to the mill pond next door, just not as big in size. Um, do you have a picture of the jellyfish? If you look at the jellyfish from the street, you're looking at that building except the hip roof is missing. Um, there you go. That's it. That's the back of the building, just you know, less the hip roof. So when Neil and his team undertook to design the building, you know, they did so to make it look like what was there originally, with a, with a nod towards it. Let's talk about what we plan to do inside the building, even though it's, it's you know, beyond what we're here to talk about. But um, the building will have a first floor on 25A, and it will be for non-medical office use. Um, one of the residents, you know, um, asked the question about, you know, how do we know that that, that first floor won't turn into a bistro or what we phrase in, in our language here as a wet use. And I said, you know, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, you should raise it. Uh, we don't mind accepting that as a condition. I understand that if, if we're going to waive some conditions and you want to put another condition in, you know, in its place, <clears throat> we, we, my client has no desire to put any type of a wet use or a retail use. It's, it's strictly an office use on the first floor, 4,000 square feet. The second floor will have six apartments, uh, two of which are two bedroom, four of which are one bedroom. And the third floor would have three apartments. So every study, every traffic impact analysis, every experience that uh, this board and every other board in the town of Huntington has had, <clears throat> this property has been used, it's had almost a 100 year history as a restaurant. We all know how rest busy restaurants can be. Um, when you look at an office use with a nine to five typical hours <clears throat> with residential apartments above, it's going to be much more benign and much more sleepy. Um, 
that's that's the gist of the of the of the of the of the project. But but to recap on the request for relief, I want to be very clear here, Mr. Chairman. We we are not requesting any variances of the town code. We are do not feel that it's appropriate to engage in a steep slope analysis at this time because I'm not making an application for any requested relief. There's no application for development. Um, all you need to do, Mr. Chairman and, 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 and Mr. Bennett, as counsel to the board, is just, just look at the enabling you know, statute, uh, section 198.61 of the code, that's the steep slope ordinance, talks about applicability. Applicability is when I get into my site plan review or a subdivision application. We're here to request permission to proceed with the rescission of the restrictive covenants, uh, the elimination of the conditions so that I can move forward with a site plan application uh, with, with the planning board. Um, I think at this point, I'll just, I'll yield the podium to any members of the uh, community that have any questions. Um, but I wanna just remind everyone that I, I do have everyone here to answer any questions. Uh, we recognize that there are three uh, expert reports as part of the uh, a part of the application. Uh, whether or not they were needed is a different question altogether. But nevertheless, uh, I don't see any particular reason why we need any of the experts to testify at this point because there is a limitation on just exactly what's before us, which is simply to remove the covenants and to. Uh, reaffirm the business depth extension, which was already granted by this board back in 2011. For parking? So at, at this point, I would like to ask anyone who wishes oh, to be I heard. Have, have you want to have a question? Yeah. All right. Um, but first, Matt, could you pull up the rendering? That's what was. Can you put in what's proposed, you know, the rendering? But I had a couple of questions on the environmental assessment form, and I went um, today. I didn't realize, I guess, it had changed. Um, the environmental assessment form was originally submitted. So I had a, just a few questions on that. Sure. Question 11, I guess originally with the sewage, you said you were gonna use, or the applicant, an alternative wastewater treatment system. I guess in the meeting I, that Monday night you referred to, it uh, became apparent that really the plan is to be on sewers. Well, more embarrassingly, Mr. McGrath, um, uh, I was quite frankly, we were caught off guard because we didn't realize that the staff member, you know, on the uh, project team that had prepared the EAF didn't appreciate that the property is in the Centerport you know, Sewer District. Not only can we not use an AI system, Mr. McGrath, and you know this, uh, right. because we are located in a sewer district, we're required by the Suffolk County Sanitary Code to connect to it. That was always the intention. Um, I had I had a good natured back and forth with uh, one of the community members, and I, I there, she, there she is, <laughs> and right. it was I, I thought it was good natured, uh, it was, and um, and we corrected it. So I, I we corrected the EAF to make sure that uh, we knew that we were connecting to the sewer. And, sewer and I forgive me, I'm not familiar with the Centerport Sewer District. Is it the Northport Sewer District that you're out of district connecting to, or is there actually, I, I was never aware of Centerport having a sewer Yeah, district. so the Centerport Sewer District is really a creature of, um, of, of statute. It doesn't have facilities, and it contracts. So everything in the Centerport Sewer District <clears throat> goes to the Northport Sewer District, but I might add, Mr. McGrath, Anyone that owns a business that's in the Centerport Sewer District will lament how expensive it is to be in the Centerport Sewer District. Um, one of the phraseologies that my colleague and friend, Mr. Breslin, um, who can't be here this evening, you know, he would say, you know, Mike, you should re remind the board or anyone that's listening that <clears throat> the Centerport Sewer District needs customers. Um, that's a polite way of, so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to provide a customer for the uh, Centerport Sewer District, which helps, which helps the whole geographic area, Mr. McGrath. Uh, okay, um, no, that clarifies that. <clears throat> Question 13, are you in a wetlands? And you said, yes, you're in a wetlands. Could you describe? Well, we have, we have a bulkhead, you know, we're, um, you know, cheek to jowl with the, with the, um, with the, um, the mill pond. Um, the bulkhead is gonna need uh, repair and replacement. Um, one of the conversations, and you're paying attention to it, and we talked about this at the community meeting, uh, was a suggestion that there, there may be a plan to do a walkway around the mill pond or a portion thereof, you know, to, just to make it scenic so you could take a nice walk. Um, I know you're paying attention. These conversations are having place in Huntington, too, with Huntington Harbor. I digress a little bit just to kind of put it into perspective. 
So the request was, um, if the property owner is going to proceed to the New York State DEC to replace the bulkhead, because of course you need jurisdiction to do that, would, would we agree to push the bulkhead out an extra you know, uh, four or five feet to allow for a future walkway? Um, I've since learned, and I think I understand, that it's, it's unlikely that the DEC would allow that to happen. Um, if there ever is a... You don't mean the bulkhead, you mean the walkway. The, we, well, we wouldn't allow you to fill in extra space. So the DEC no. would allow you, require you to replace the bulkhead. But if you wanted to accommodate a walkway, it would be more in the nature of a cantilever out over, over the water as opposed to backfilling and taking away wetland. Okay, um, thank you on that. The, Which, the, by the way, yep. you know, um, and I'll, this will be a, a function of planning, uh, my client has agreed to do. So, you know, if, if the town says, you know, we, we, will you cooperate with this future proposed walkway and, and it makes sense, you know, my, my client's willing to, to be a participant. Yeah, I understand. I'm just going through my, you know, secret is always supposed to come first. We always have this banter back and forth. Sometimes it comes last and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're do, doing it in the right order. So just going through this. Um, another DEC question, and this is sort of an important one. Um, does the site contain any species that are threatened or endangered? And you answered, yeah, bald eagle's nest is 1,200 feet away from the site. Um, and my question is, and we know from the last time with that ale court application that the DEC has specific regulations. And in this case, it says you can't build for sure if you're within 660 feet. But if you uh, go out to a quarter mile and the eagles have an unobstructed view and they can look at it, uh, that is a no build zone, no new construction. So my question, because we talked about bulkhead under Secra, uh, and we also now have the bald eagles where it says you can't do it within 1300. I don't, I don't know much about eagles in a location, but 62 foot high on that side of the building and the eagles, I think they'll be able to look right at it. Um, have you talked to the DEC about the bulkheads? Um, have you coordinated with them, which we're required to do under CEQA? Uh, before we even get into depth extensions or possible variances, have, have we coordinated this? Well, let me let's drop back a couple yards because you're, you're, you're presupposing answers that I think, quite frankly, um, are, are, are based upon a false premise. First and foremost, and I've had this conversation with Mr. Bennett and Mr. Gathman, I, I, don't, I don't believe that based upon the nature of the relief that we're requesting, that we even needed to prepare and submit an EAF short form. And the, and the reason why we didn't need to prepare it is because the nature of the request for the relief is a type two action pursuant to CEQA. And all you have to do is read the CEQA statute, and I've provided the annotations to Mr. Bennett, that we're talking about a mixed use building in a commercial zone. It doesn't meet the threshold. We're also talking about an interpretation. But, Mr. McGrath, to continue, we did prepare and submit an environmental assessment form. I do believe it's a type two action. At a minimum, it's an unlisted action. And any interaction that needs to take place with the Department of, of Environmental Conservation will take place during site plan review. Now, I don't know any of the conversations that my clients, consultants have had with the New York State DEC I, I could ask Mr. Robinson to come down. He's got the handbook on what you do when there's a bald eagle. But I believe we're, we're without, we are outside the zone. And parenthetically, I, I didn't draft that EIF. Um, well, the consultant we know did. The, the lady who made the mistake, the <laughs> staff member. Well, I don't agree with it. So. Okay. Okay. Um, we, you know that we decide whether it's unlisted or type two, and I don't know. It's. It's a big building, uh, nine apartments, and not to be subject to secret, uh, you know, I, I would think that would be a stretch. But either way, Mr. McGrath, we would if, still, but, but, we would wouldn't, still, wouldn't you agree that that would happen during site plan review, though? No, no, we're the lead, lead agency on the secret. We're the lead agency. Are you sure about yeah, that? Yeah, yes, yes. And the planning, the planning board wanted it that way, okay. okay? I know things seem to be changing, you know, so. But we're the lead agency. I don't know that Secret anything's changed, first. Mr. McGrath. I don't, I don't, DEC, okay. e, even if it was a type two, which I don't think, you still need to get the DEC's input on, on the bulkhead as well as the Eagles, which is no minor matter. So I was yes, just during site plan review. No, no, no. It's it's we're the lead agency. So anyway, we're really. But you answered me on the planning, the planning recommendation for the walkway. 
you willing to do it, but it's probably going to be a problem. It would have to be over the water itself. No, no, it would only be a problem if we had to push the bulkhead out into the water. Oh. Yeah. I'm, all I'm indicating to you is the client is willing to cooperate. Okay, I got that. I think that was the last of my, uh, oh, last one. Secret of whores. I'm looking at Danny, <laughs> looking at Danny Carpin. Segmentation, secret, uh, absolutely abhors uh, uh, segmentation. Are you aware of any nearby similar properties? Because if you're aware, we have to look at the total aggregate impact. Are you aware of anybody else nearby possibly doing this? How, how far away, Mr. McGrath? Let's start with next door. Okay. <laughs> and what are you suggesting? What would happen well, next well, door? Well, if you are aware that next door, and I understand there is some relationship, okay, you know, but if you're aware of a plan under SECRA, you can't give me one thing and we do all the research and then do the other. You have to look at it in the aggregate. You know, it's just clear. And, and, and it's actually helping your client too because in Centerport when they were going to build that 7-Eleven, they got it approved. It went in front of a judge, and the judge said, okay, it was great you all approved it, but you did seek last. And that's why there's no 7-Eleven in Centerport, okay, because of the judge. So, it actually, and actually I'm looking at Daniel Carp, and it was his statement that started that whole thing. So, uh, so, by doing this first, getting it straight, it helps your client later when you do get approval, if you get approval. Um, keeps you out of court, so that's why I bring it up, to be helpful. Thank you for your help, Mr. McGrath. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm done with my presentation, and if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Um, if there's anyone that wishes to be heard regarding this matter, uh, I do know that there was an attorney that uh, I thought may have uh, appeared on behalf of the Civic Association. So before I ask Mr. Carpin up, I want to see if Mr. Berger is in the house. Yes, I am. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I got involved in this thing a couple weeks ago. Unfortunately, uh, at the time, there were representations made by the applicant that this was not a steep slope situation and that uh, it was almost an as of right uh, approval that uh, was being submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I started looking at the code. Uh, the representation was made, first of all, that it, it was commercial, steep slope doesn't apply. 198.61b of the steep slope ordinance says it applies to development in all zoning districts, right? Then the next thing I heard, either from the planning department or from uh, 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 feedback from the Civic Associ Association with respect to Mr. McCarthy's meeting with him, uh, that there's an existing building on the site and that steep slope doesn't apply because of that. And then 198.61d says that steep slope applies to new buildings which replace existing buildings in a contained hillside area. Okay, so that uh, misapplication was set aside. Uh, then finally, you know, after I convinced uh, the um, senior planning director that maybe steep slope applied and he indicated I might have made a mistake, he got back to me a couple of days later and said, well, steep slope doesn't apply because this is not a uh, hillside area because there's no vegetation on it. And then I pointed out to him section 198.2 of the code, the definition co section of the code, uh, says that a hillside area is by definition a geographical area, whether natural or man-made. So at this point in time, we have a steep slope situation. Mr. Carpin went by today. He's a professional engineer. He took some measurements with uh, uh, some type of meter that he uses to calculate the slope of a a geographical area, and he indicated that uh, there is a slope, and you'll hear from Mr. Carp and testify that, uh, that this is a steep slope situation. All right, given that, yeah, you're indicating that uh, all of this is going to be taken care of in site plan review. First of all, under 198, 116D of the code, site plan review doesn't require any type of public input. They can do this site plan review in, in private without giving the public notice. And I think in this particular instance, the public should be involved in this thing from beginning to end. 
Furthermore, 198.65.1a of the Steep Slope Ordinance, Article 10, says no special use for, uh, permit shall be approved, granted, or released by any board for development requiring site plan review by the planning board if any portion of the property is in a hillside area until the provisions of this article have been applied. So you can't do anything until the steep slope analysis has been done. Whether you want to do it or you want to kick it back to the planning board, 198.65.1a precludes you from making any decision on the special use permit tonight. Okay. But Mr. Berger, I just want to I want to be sure that we understand each other on this. We're not we're we're not being asked for a special use permit. It's never been applied for in in this situation at all. And He's that's asked why I indicated that there was an error in the publication and the notices that went out. The only two things that are in front of us is to remove the conditions which is which I've already indicated, I think it abates as a matter of law, and whether or not the extension of business depth, which was granted back in 2011, it, it continues if it runs with the land. That's the only thing in front of us. Now, what I understand about the steep slope, and, I, and you've made these arguments in writing, uh, and you're making them on the record now, and I think that the, the planning staff and the planning board is aware of some of your arguments and will take them into consideration. I'm unaware of what their requirements are in terms of notification to the public. Okay. You're, you, you, you're, you're certainly invited. There is a, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, there is a publication with respect to the fact that the planning board meets in public. They're, they're televised also and, they're, and they're, they have an agenda and you can follow the agenda and then you can ask to make presentations. The planning board from time to time does have people speak, so I'm, I'm well, sure that, the, that they will you this. They'll take your, your comments into consideration. Are they asking for a business depth extension tonight? They're asking whether or not the business ex depth extension, which they have already received in 2011, runs with the land or not. That's okay, what so they're asking for. In essence, they're asking for a business de depth extension because but, this is a new use. It's, the, in a, it's, it's, in a, it's they're, just they're for taking parking. down an existing building and putting up a new building. So they need a business depth extension for a totally new use. And I will cite 198.65.1G of the Steep Slope Ordinance. A special use permit for a business depth extension or variance shall not be granted if the extension or variance will result in development in any portion of the conservation area required under 198.65.1c or 198.65.1e. So there is no way you can give a business depth extension until the steep slope analysis is done either by you or by the planning board. So you can, you can cut it any way you want. You're putting the cart before the horse. The steep slope application has to be done because it affects each and every other element of this plan and carries through to the end of the plan. It'll carry through to where this building can be located. It, go, it will carry through where the business depth extension uh, can be granted, if any. So before we even get to removing the uh, special use uh, conditions or granting a business depth extension, you have to do the steep slope analysis. Now whether you want to do it or whether you want to kick it back to the planning board is immaterial, but it has to be done first. Now, um, I'd also like to point out, uh, insofar as CEQRO is concerned, this is uh, Mr. Car Mr. McCarthy, representative of the regulations. This is a type two plan. This is not a type two plan. The type two plans are specifically listed in the regs under uh, 6 NYCRR section 617.4.5. This is an unlisted action. An unlisted action can require the preparation of a long form EAF and a, uh, an unlisted action can also result in a positive declaration, okay? Um, I would respectfully submit that given the fact that uh, this is in a title, it's adjacent to a title wetlands area, um, the Bald Eagle situation is involved with the DEC, they're going to need wetland permits from the DEC, 
this is adjacent to a critical environmental area uh, under the Department of Environmental uh, um, DEC regulations. Uh, State Road 25 is a, histenic, uh, is a historic and scenic road under um, Part 180 of the session laws of the state of New York in 1974. Uh, there's, a, there's a multitude of reasons why uh, there are substantial environmental impacts that uh, have to be taken a hard look at and make a determination as to whether or not uh, there has to be amelioration of the, the environmental impacts from this uh, proposed development. So I would respectfully request, since you've taken lead agency status, even though the majority of the uh, work, according to the chronology which you've given here, is gonna be by the planning board and, the, and or the DEC, that given the uh, environmental or potential environmental impacts of this project and the um, historic and uh, sensitive environmental adjacent areas that a positive declaration be issued and that a long-form EAF be prepared at a minimum, and depending on what the long-form EAF reveals, that perhaps there may be the requirement of an environmental impact statement. Uh, there was an allusion to um, what's gonna happen to uh, the mill pond. My information, or, or let's just say upon information and belief, I have uh, learned that some of the staff on the mill pond have already given their notice and are intending to leave. I verily believe that is, if this application is granted, that the owner of this property, which happens to be also the owner of some of the principals of jellyfish, are also the principals of the mill pond, uh, intend to make a similar application with respect to the mill pond that, and they, they want to close the mill pond, which is certainly historical. It's been with this town for, for years. Um, a lot of the members of the board have, have, have been here since they were young and they know, you know what the mill pond means from a historical standpoint. I would hate to see the mill pond go. But in any event, since they're asking for uh, either the revocation or a grant of a special use permit, which, whichever way you want to cut it, they're, they're asking for relief uh, with respect to a special use permit. So under either scenario, I believe you have the ability to impose conditions. And I would respectfully request that one of the conditions you impose should you grant the special use or revocation of the special use permit in this particular application is to uh, get a uh, a covenant restriction that the uh, mill pond will not uh, fall to the same development that this property uh, prospectively is uh, going to be developed for. Um, that pretty much concludes my remarks with respect to the uh, um, this application, and I, I would just like to say one one other thing. Uh, you know, it's it's it, it seems as though. In a lot of occasions, you can pick and choose the way you interpret things. And I just want to point to the water's edge where there were covenants and restrictions that ran with the land that we attempted to uh, assert that the board was required to honor these covenants and restrictions with respect to the off-site parking because those covenant restrictions said that when jellyfish and water's edge went out of business that uh, the, the parking lot, the adjacent parking lot behind Nicky's reverted to residential use, okay? We were given the, the Stroud case which Mr. Modulewski uh, basically resurrected during his tenure as the chairman of the board as, as authority that you know you had no you had no ability to enforce those covenants and restrictions that we had to go back to the town board and ask them to enforce those covenants and restrictions now you're taking the position in this particular application that the covenants and restrictions are void by operational law so in one instance they're they're void by the operational law. In another instance, they weren't void by the operational law. So I'd, I'd ask for some type of administrative consistency with respect to the interpretation, interpretation of these covenants and restrictions. Taking notes, really on your, taking notes on your presentation, Mr. Berger, and uh, 
the covenants and restrictions that are referred to, that I referred to, were imposed by the Zoning Board, by the zoning board of Appeals. They were imposed by the Zoning Board of Appeals and, and recorded in Suffolk County. It's much, much different than private entities having covenants and restrictions. So, no, that, so that, this is a, a totally different legal issue. I disagree with you. Those covenants and restrictions were recorded in the Suffolk County Clerk's Office. I have copies in my office, so they, they were recorded easements. I disagree with you there. but. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, there's some uh, intellectual That's what lawyers do, here. Mr. Berger. What? That's what lawyers do. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? Mr. Carpin, you're next. Thank you. Welcome to the Daniel Carpin Show, direct from Town Hall paid for and produced by the town of Huntington and for the benefit of its taxpayers. Oh, I'd like to thank everybody who enjoys listening to the Daniel Carpin Show. Tonight, I am talking about 1441 East Main Street, otherwise known as Jellyfish Property. In my view, because of Onondaga Landfills versus Flake, there was no long-term plan when the jellyfish was approved by the zoning board to convert this into apartments. It is very clear in Onondaga Landfills versus Flake. I didn't bring copies with you, with me tonight. You probably have in, in your folder, in your files someplace. Onondaga Landfills versus Flake involved a mining permit operation that was gonna be issued by the DEC but the DEC wanted to know what the long range plan was gonna be. Okay, sorry. When the, um, when the, uh, uh, when the uh, mine was gonna be closed. So he got this big issue of segmentation. And the fact that jellyfish closed, the only use for this property realistically is for it to continue as a, continue as a restaurant. Now, I'm going to talk about the steep slope situation. Darren Berger called me this afternoon on no time at all. Daniel, can you, can you um, take care of this for me? So I went over to the jellyfish property. I'm going to hand you a diagram. So I'd like to have um, someone pass it out to all the um, zoning board members and the staff. There's, a, I believe, Sorry. Uh, 10 copies, so that should be enough, nine or 10 copies. So I'm gonna hold off my testimony while everybody gets a copy and I can explain you what I did. At four o'clock this afternoon, I went over to the jellyfish property. You have in front of you a exhibit 29 from the Zoning Board of Appeals file 20057. I took the plan and I went to the, I, I made some modifications to it and wrote, wrote in handwriting what I saw. On the east side of Jellyfish, the driveway running down the side has an average slope of about 8% from point one to point two. On the west side of Jellyfish, there's another driveway, and it has an average slope of between 13 and 15%, and it's more than 25 feet wide. Now the reason why I'm saying 13 to 15% is a sort of a curvature to the, uh, to the slope. And also it depends on whether you're gonna, you're gonna make a measurement right down the middle or whether you're gonna go from the right-hand corner from the northwest corner to the southeast corner or from the south, southwest corner to the northeast corner. 
and the instrument I used is a clinometer, and I'm showing it right here, and you look for, through the viewfinder, and you read off percents. And basically, that's how you use it, and foresters use it to measure heights of trees, which is what I bought it for. So what we have is a case where the, uh, the, where they, where they want to put the new um, building, and I'll hand out um, something, I'm sure everyone has it, but let's hand it out anyway as an exhibit. Who's going to do the handing out? I can't. And Matt, did, did I miss it? Did you ever put, put up the new rendering? What, what, what's being, we saw the old, we, we saw the current, we saw the old. Did we ever put the new one up? Yeah, it was up. It was oh, up. it was? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was talking. The building's on the other side. There it is. What I have in front of me is only Xerox a portion of the new rendering of the new building. And you can see the new building is located in the southwest corner of the Mill Pen Pond property, of the jellyfish property. But where it's located, where it's, it's in the steep slope district. And you've got to, re, you've got to allow the 15% of the steep slope district has got to be preserved. And as Darren mentioned, it doesn't matter whether it's vegetation or a driveway, it's still a steep, steep slope. So where the new building is located is in the wrong place. Sorry, it's in the wrong place. And because of the requirements of CICRA, you're going to have to do a, you can't do segment and review. Jerry Asher, it's simply illegal. Simply illegal to do a segmented review. And because of Onondaga Landville versus Flake, if you interpret it properly, the only use for this property is a restaurant. You can't change use in midstream. And unlike criminal statute, CICRA has no statute of limitations. It was, CICRA went into a fully effect in New York State in 1979. And that's the situation we have. So if you really want to interpret Onondaga landfills versus Flake in terms of a long range plan, there's no long range plan when the jellyfish was closed, was opened, that it was going to be closed to convert it into apartments. That didn't exist. Therefore, it's illegal application. You can't even consider it anymore. And the worst problem is that the impact intake procedures at the Zoning Board of Appeals are so Byzantine and outdated that this application should have never been put on the agenda. And when you make mistakes like, you know, not a, not listing what li, not uh, listing in the app in the uh, legal notice what's really happening, that's also bad too. It's bad publicity for the zoning board of appeals. And in terms of complying with secret, right now the zoning board of appeals is a, has a ZBA zero batting average. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard regarding the application? You may step up. Good evening. My name is Ann Wesp. I live at 21 Prospect Road in Centerport, and I'm currently the president of the Centerport Harbor Civic Association. I do have grave concerns about these plans, but I'm actually quite concerned about the ZBA right now. Your own document about ZBA procedures for hearing states an application will not be considered complete or calendared for a hearing unless all required information is included in the packet. It goes on to say, all applications will be loaded to a shared website no less than 10 days prior to the scheduled hearing and will be accessible to the planning, zoning department staff, zoning board members, and to the general public. Yet, a revised short form EAF was sent to the file on July 26, well within the 10 day period. But the ZBA did not move to move this meeting. Why not? 
These are your own rules that should apply. So I don't even know why we're here tonight. Additionally, there's a whole bunch of us here that have things to say about what we have as concerns. You're saying we can't say them tonight and that maybe we should say them at the planning board. But does the planning board actually let us come and give our whole litany of things that we're worried about? Is that an open meeting? Do they welcome outsiders coming in with questions? So either we tell you tonight or we don't get to tell the planning board, where is our right to be heard? So I ask that you adjourn this meeting on this topic right now, because under your own rules, you shouldn't be here discussing it. If you, if you wish to be heard tonight, you may be heard tonight. OK. Now I'm back. <laughs> You've already heard a lot about steep slopes, so I'm not going to get into that one. However, Town Code Section 198.27 C6 General Business District Number 23A applies to mixed-use buildings such as this states the following. No upper floor exceeds the footprint of the ground floor. However, as demonstrated in the plans right above your heads, the portions of both the second and third floors extend over the portico which is the driveway. It is not part of the ground floor. So it does exceed the footprint of the building. How can this determination be made when relevant sections of the zoning code are not being addressed? So I'm going to turn it over to the rest of my team. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Betsy Cambria and I live at One Bull Calf Landing in Centerport, which is located approximately 200 yards from this proposed mixed-use building formerly known as the Jellyfish. The application for variance before the zoning board should consider the following. The front of the structure is three stories high. There is a lower floor facing the environmentally sensitive center Centerport Mill Pond. Is that lower floor uh, above grade plane as per section 198.2? And if so, then this is a four story building, and the current plans need to be redrawn, revised, and resubmitted to the board. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Judy White. I live at Six Spring Hollow Road in Centerport, New York. No relationship to Mr. White on the ZBA. <laughs> uh, I'd like to address two things, traffic and the environmental impact, the EAF, the short form EAF that was submitted. I understand that Mr. McCarthy has said that Jellyfish has been used as a restaurant for a hundred years, and I understand that. But a hundred years ago, we were going to restaurants in horse and buggies, not cars. In addition to which, this has not been used as a restaurant for the last 10 years. And since that time, the increase in traffic along 25A for anyone who has traveled it recently has been quite phenomenal. We have a situation where the employees of the mill pond and sometimes the customers 
park in front of Jellyfish. When I drove past there this evening on my way here, there were 12 cars parked in front of Jellyfish. I didn't drive to the back to see who was parked in the back. Nowhere in Mr. McCarthy's presentation before the Civic Association or tonight has he suggested where those cars that park in front of Jellyfish are going to park when this becomes a commercial building and apartments. A huge concern on this is that they just meet the parking requirements. And the parking requirements are based on the fact that the nine apartments and the people who are in those apartments are going to leave those apartments every day and those parking spaces will be used by the people coming to the commercial uh, entities. I hope that none of those nine apartments have people in them who work from their residence because if those nine apartments don't vacate every day, we're going to have an issue with parking. Now, I also understand that the chances of having school-aged children in the two-bedroom apartments is very slim. There's no doubt about that. But even if there's one child in those apartments, where does a school bus go to pick up a child? Where does a prime truck go to deliver things? Where does any delivery truck go to deliver things? The front of this building is nine feet from the shoulder of the road. I'm sorry, my time is up. I do have a statement with regard to some of the environmental issues, if I could submit that. You may. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Robert Birding, 45 Prospect Road, Center Port, New York, 11721. Uh, thank you for letting us speak tonight. Uh, I also found it um, very um, enlightening to listen to the series of either omissions along the way because my original presentation, I had some questions about exactly what was going to be built for a bulkhead or a shoreline. So I'm glad to hear that that isn't part of a plan yet but we do want to make sure that whatever is done to the shoreline or to a bulkhead is done under the auspices of the DEC. We as Centerport Harbor Civic Association took the initiative to share whatever information we had with the DEC concerned that they were unaware of this project. We found that they didn't have any applications to date, although we understand there was some coordination on the part of the town. It was not clear what coordination that might be. And we really just want to see that our environment is protected and that the EC is that authority knows fully what's going on, a comprehensive plan, and hopefully, based on some of the requirements I'm hearing here tonight, that that will happen. My last point uh, was actually uh, kind of compounded for me because one of the questions that I had, I had the concern about the utility of a walkway behind the jellyfish for about 100 feet or 150 feet. Why would you need a walkway there? Who would walk on a walkway like that? You're not gonna walk down 25A, risk your life and the traffic going back and forth to walk down between a restaurant and a catering hall so that I can walk 100 feet along a, wa a public walkway. Hearing tonight that that plan may be expanded and that we may lose the mill pond and that the walkway is gonna go further and further, it actually scares me even further as a resident that is there other kinds of planning going on beyond what we're hearing today, the segmented type of plan, and instead we ask the board to look holistically at whatever happens. We have our concerns about the environment and our homes and we're just homeowners, we're, we just, love our community, we love the bucolic area, and we are not against development per se. Land should be put to good use. We're not saying that should never be used for anything, but it should be a use that fits in with everything. So thank you for your time. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you, Mr. Bergen. Hi, good evening. Dr. Catherine Knight, 18 Mora Hopper Road, Centerport. Um, with all due respect, this is not 1930 or, 19, or 2011. This is 2023. It breaks my heart to see that beautiful picture of the Whitney Mansion, which we've referred to that property as Jellyfish. But in fact, that was the Whitney family home. And it was beautiful. And, and it pains me, it pains my heart to see what has happened to it. It is a historic building. There is a placard in the front put there by the town of Huntington. But I'd like to talk about drainage. A June 22nd memo from Matt Weeder on behalf of the planning board states, quote, currently a large portion of the drainage from this property enters directly into Mill Pond. During the required state, sorry, site plan review, the applicant should be required to install a berm containing a mix of plants, which will help filter the runoff prior to entering the pond, end of quote. There are two issues with this. Any berm would cut into the space. Thank you for putting the, the photo of the Whitney Mansion. It's just gorgeous, beautiful. Any berm would cut into the space available for parking, which is already right at the minimum of the required spaces. Adding a berm would mean that there would be not enough space for the required parking. Um, I was curious, I measured the berm that was installed by the town at Centerport Beach this afternoon to see what an effective berm should look like. It is 26 feet wide and runs for several hundred feet parallel to the beach curbing with certain breaks for pedestrians who are parking on one side to walk to the other side. So a viable berm for this property, one that would serve a purpose to catch some of that runoff from the parking area and 25A would require significant width. Instead of a berm, the applicant should consider creating stormwater catch basins to contain the runoff water on site. I thank you for your time tonight and letting us speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Knight. Good evening, and um, my name is Alan Perlman. I live at 8 Harned Drive here in Centerport. Um, many of us in the community are concerned about the parking issues that will arise with the building of the proposed offices and apartments. Uh, the proposed designated parking spaces on the former Jellyfish property must be reserved exclusively for the people living in the proposed building that will be built on this property and also for the people who will be working in the proposed offices that will be built on this property. But since Jellyfish closed, uh, the Mill Pond House and at times Water's Edge, I believe, have been using that Jellyfish property to park approximately 30 cars at busy times on a regular basis. If cars from these neighboring businesses are no longer allowed to be parked there, then the question is where will these businesses park these cars? They shouldn't end up on residential streets, but some provision for adequate parking must be made for cars from these businesses. I realize that this CBA hearing is not about Mill Pond or Water's Edge, it's about the future of the Jellyfish property but since the owners of Mill Pond House also own jellyfish property, um, and since parking is going to be in such short supply, this is a relevant issue that needs to be discussed and resolved. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brawler. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Asher, in your opening remarks, Mr. Asher, in your opening, your name, uh, your name oh yes, uh, my name is Bob Lopez. I'm a board member of the Centerport Harbor Civic Association, and I live at 18 Upper Pond Court, Centerport. Okay. Okay. Uh, in your opening remarks, uh, you had comment. The first statement you, you you brought across was that we're that 
there are board members and there are uh, administrators who are human. And that errors get made. When you have humans involved, it happens. Uh, the developer, when it came to the board meeting with our board, made mistakes, apologized. We respectfully received apologies from ZBA. We respectfully received apologies from the developer. Errors happen. We're all human. We respect that. But sometimes errors delay the review of documents. As a board member, I have an obligation to our neighbors to explain whether a proposal is good or bad for the community in our opinion. Unfortunately, errors made by ZBA, errors made by the town, has resulted in a tremendous amount of conflicting statements and confusion. Uh, not for ill will, but just the nature of information getting out there that errors are made. Uh, there were revisions, uh, an application for the uh, the proposal spoke to connecting to the sewer, not connect, and then we were not connecting to the sewer system, then it was said, oh, a mistake was made. Uh, th the application speaks to parking for tenants and businesses, but then all of a sudden at a meeting, they said, well, what about spillover from Mill Pond? Well, we can do that too. We said, well, we don't, there's nothing in your application saying the parking in the apartments will be used for spillover from uh, the Mill Pond. Uh, but again, that, that there's numerous issues here. It's confusing a lot of people. The overflow parking, the sewer district, the steep slope, they've all been mentioned here. These conflicting assertions create confusion. And unfortunately, we are not even prepared to make a hard decision on whether this is good or bad because we're getting conflicting information. So based on the need that additional information uh, is needed to resolve some of these, and based on the um, the fact that uh, the areas are routinely viewed 20, Carta 25A as unsafe, um, we really need to pause. And uh, the first role of government is to protect the safety of the community. And I will tell you, I've been to these meetings before, the ZBA at the end of their deliberation have with great passion uh, instructed the town to work in partnership with the restaurants, the state and the county to resolve the serious uh, issues of safety on 25A. Unfortunately, with all due respect, uh, it's fallen on deaf ears. Uh, the restaurants uh, continue to park in the no parking zone. Uh, the uh, restaurants continue to have happy hour signs in the uh, safety area. So uh, we really need you to respectfully uh, do not make a decision tonight, reserve your decision until we as humans can receive the information we need to have an opinion. And I would think that you'd want to have the information corrected and, and provided so that we can have a discussion. Perhaps we need to come back w once again once those questions and, uh, are answered. And I respectfully uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Shell Salt. I live at 106 Harrison Drive, Centerport. And I'm presenting to you, Chairman, and to the board. My concern is, my biggest concern is the overdevelopment of this town, this area, and not preserving it. So what happens if this happens, and what could happen to the chalet? You know, somebody can come in and put a shopping center there and build three stories. And you're taking away our, our beautiful area, our home that we treasure. And you grew up here, Judge. And you, don't you want to leave a legacy of something beautiful taking care of this town? We're building everywhere. And it's not just me. It's, I talk to my friends, I talk to my neighbors, and we're all concerned about what's going on here in our beautiful home. And that's all I have to say. You should think okay. about that. You should think Thank about you. holding our legacy. Yeah. Hello, my name is Anna Mallett, A-N-N-A-M-A-L-L-E-T-T, -T, and I reside at 79 Little Neck Road. In 1970, I was born in Huntington Hospital and brought home to that address. My father, in 1984, started the Centerport Harbor Revital Revitalization Committee. If you want any information about the Mill Pond, believe me, it's in my home. My mother throws nothing out. I would like to thank Mr. McCarthy tonight for his presentation and the opportunity to speak. Um, a number of issues have been addressed. Uh, submitting the correct form was, I think, helpful. 
I live in this town and now I own a business in this town. I'm probably one of the oldest residents also of the town, being that I've lived here now for 53 years. The town has changed drastically and I think that there is a way for thoughtful development and that we can embrace change while we honor tradition. One of those things is, I don't know if the old photo is available, but if you compare that old photo to no disrespect to the architects, I realize that you probably designed a great building for honestly someplace else. Um, if you look at the two, they really don't even remotely look the same with the exception of this one gets the burned out story back. Um, also, and I don't know the law as well as many people here, but one of the first things that you said, Chairman Asher, was that the covenants and restrictions are moved immediately by no need of, because it's not a restaurant with decks. But I believe I'm looking at decks and balconies on the back of the new residents. So they can dine there, they can have as much noise there as possible, this is, will be their home. And they are renters, we're taxpayers, and voters. We count. And a lot of times through the years, since 1985, when the New York Times first covered the story about saving the mill pond because of Don Pius, and the town had to buy the corn a lot back for the deal of $100,000, while Don only paid, I think it was 33000 I believe Mr. Bennett may remember some of that. Um, my point is this. We all have to live together. The man owns the property. He does have a right to develop it. However, he is a member of the community, though I don't see him here tonight. Um, this is not fitting compared to what was there. And I guess maybe it's me that doesn't see it. But again, as a business owner, I would love to have people. No one is saying the building is not an eyesore. It's horrific. But could we maybe not go so big? I once worked in fashion. We had a phrase, just because it zips doesn't mean it fits. So just because you can do it doesn't mean you need to squeeze it in. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Hello, board. My name is Robert Schwartz. I'm a lifelong resident of this area. I just want to read something uh, quickly. Um, it's on the Huntington website, and it says that the planning, building, and zoning boards here uh, to function, they're a function of the government in determining how land in the town can and should be developed, setting the standards of how buildings are constructed. We're setting a new standard here, a new precedent with having apartments that surround this area that don't fit here and the residents don't want as provided as the example. That's number one. Number two, my biggest concern is the environment. The last time we went through this process with Water's Edge, we were forced to jump up and down and protest in order to get a boom put in the water to protect the wetlands there. I'm not sure who lives here, but I challenge anyone to come to this area on a Friday or Saturday night and see the traffic. It's a very small road. You can only fit one lane. There's no forgiveness. Um, a few years ago, there was an accident right in front of the jellyfish that took out a number of cars because there isn't room for a mistake there. If someone has to stop or get around someone, there's no place to go. I also want to correct one other thing. The environment here contains hundreds of species of different wildlife that migrate to this area. We should be taking extra special look at this area and how it's developed. The migrating birds are that nest in our area are unlike many other places on Long Island. And one final note regarding the eagles that are there. We had a, a problem last year with one of the eagles that passed away. It's since got a new mate. From the back of jellyfish, you can see the nest plainly. It's in sight. And just one other um, fact, it's actually 1,072 feet from that property line to the nest. So we are within those boundaries that we need to make special consideration how the building is constructed, when the building is constructed, or if the building is constructed. I have the greatest idea 
that there is. There is no public park in Centerport for kids to play. If the builder really, not one public park, if you don't have a sticker to get in, if you don't pay, a kid can't ride a swing in Centerport. So if the builder really cared about that area, let's turn that area into a, a play area for kids that we can get the kids back outside uh, where it should be, in front of the water, with their families and the children there. So, but please take it. One final note. The planning board is, like I said originally, they're responsible for how or what is developed. No one is looking at Centerport and you're, you're not talking to each other. You're putting things that once belonged in fit, now don't. The times have changed. There are many more cars, many more residents, many more things that take into effect consideration that you should be looking at as residents and taxpayers, we hope that you do, but no one seems to be looking. It takes us to get up and, and beg not to put a 7-Eleven in a high traffic area. You know, and you have a, a mill, mill pond, which we love, and we want something built where jellyfish is. And then you have Water's Edge that's massive with a lot of cars. Then you have a fire department. Then you have church goers and beach goers. The area is overwhelmed with traffic, and you need to consider that in the decision making process. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Carol Zweilich. I live at 18 Upper Pond Court in Centerport. I'm a member of the Centerport Harbor, I'm a, I'm a board member of the Centerport Harbor Civic Association. And I would just like to bring up two points. One, again, going back to height variance. The application proposes a building with a mean roof height of 52.6 feet. Section 198-27G provides that all buildings with residential uses on the upper stories shall not exceed 38 feet in height. The application requires a height variance from the ZBA. There's quite a lot of confusion as to how tall this building is supposed to be, three or four stories. We're very concerned about that. We need clarification. And we would also like to know, is the ZBA the lead agency for CEQA? I think that's already been answered. Right. We are. Okay. Just for the record. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Tom McKay, 10 Coleman Court, Dix Hills, New York. I was scheduled tonight, uh, where I was planning to speak about um, a number of issues, um, but uh, based on Mr. Asher's comments in the beginning, they geared uh, more towards the planning board. Um, that being said, the first one question I have, though, is tonight, you mentioned that the advertisement publication for this, for this hearing tonight was erroneous. The question is, why are we here tonight? If it's erroneous, why wasn't it canceled and republished? It, it wasn't erroneous that, that we were going to actually meet and, and discuss some of the things that are laid out in 198.110 and also on uh, 198.111 and 198.109. The language, the introductory language made it appear as though that we were going to entertain a special use permit and an extension of parking area which we're not entertaining. and so. The, the advertisement was to some degree a bit misleading, but it wasn't misleading that we're having a hearing, and we're having the hearing, and everybody's a part of it. All right. Number two is the, um, tonight's timing of the meeting. This is a, obviously based on the number of people here uh, in the Senate Port community, that it's a, it's a highly controversial issue, which you know, generating a great concern, and rightly so, for a number of people. Um, the question is, why would the chair schedule the meeting on August 3rd, which is, you know, my, I consider this pretty much the height of vacation season for people in this community. Uh, many people in Centerport, I, I assume, are most likely away for the week, two weeks. You know, why wasn't, what is the urgency? Why couldn't this be pushed off until after Labor Day where more people from this community would have the opportunity to come and be heard? Number three is the, um, the assessment form. There was a question, you know, that Talk about the, Mr. McCarthy mentioned the fact that we didn't even have to do an assessment form. I, I believe he said that. Uh, there's, you know, legalese talk about what kind of form we got to do and so forth. But I think that 
we need to, the town, you know, the planning board is only board and the town board. We need to start thinking about not so much what the law is, but what's, what's the right thing to do. And if this requires a, a further environmental review than just based on a, a simple one-page form, then do a more extensive environmental review. The developers, these guys, they can afford it. If they need to do more review, let's do it to make sure that all these concerns of the residents and the environmental concerns with the bald eagle, endangered species, freshwater, you know, the wetlands, and so forth, that all those concerns are addressed. That's just, and then the last thing is that I just noticed tonight that there are six members of the zoning board here tonight. Town board, there's seven members. <laughs> Why isn't there not, sorry, so argument's sake, say one person's sick or whatever, but you have two alternates. Why isn't one of the alternates here tonight? All the alternates are presently sitting in front of everybody right now. Oh, so you have two. We two. have two alternates and they're sitting right next to me or to my left, both of them. So we have two zoning we board members. We have two alternates. We have two members of the zoning board that are out on medical leave. They both suffered significant accidents and they're recovering from surgery. And the two alternates that have been appointed are here sitting tonight. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the ZBA. My name is Steve Goldstein. I live at 6 Harnad Drive, Centerport, and uh, I'd like to talk about the project. Um, as Mr. Lopez uh, mentioned earlier, uh, from the earliest time of civilization, the purpose of government, whether it was by brute force elected or by popular vote, is to protect the citizens and the residents of the community here. So I'd like to talk about uh, one of those safety-related issues, and that's uh, 25A and how it relates to this project. Um, at the meeting at the Harbor Fields Library on July 24th, the room was standing room only. Almost all of the concerns expressed by the people in attendance were related to State Road 25A and the entrance and exit of vehicles entering and exi exiting the property. New York 25A at that location is the most heavily traveled roadway in Centerport. Um, and in the proposed project is set between two food-related establishments with a very sizable amount of vehicles pulling in and out day and night. So in order to mitigate the accidents that occur frequently at this sector of roadway, including the intersection of Little Neck Road and 25A, I'm requesting that the ZBA either on its own or in conjunction with New York State DOT, require only right-hand uh, right turns in and out of this new project. This will prevent cars from having to cross onto oncoming traffic and hopefully lessen the possibility of an accident at this heavily transited location. Uh, the precedent for my asking, my asking for only right-hand turns in and out are the uh, abandoned 7-Eleven project. That was part of the DOT's uh, requirement. Um, so that pretty much uh, concludes my presentation. I do want to mention that um, I noticed that people from time to time, this applies to the town, come up with last minute documents, whether they're photographs or articles that the town consider purchasing a relatively inexpensive device known as a document camera. You simply take whatever you hand in your hand, you put it on a table like this, and there's a camera right above it. And who's ever handling the, the uh, switching can switch to the document camera. So not just the board members of the town or the ZBA, so the audience can see as well what they're saying. And, um, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Allison Anderson. I live at um, 87 Van Buren Street in Centerport, um, and I've been a lifelong resident. Me and Subby got this kitty fish toy from Mayma. It has fun bells and feathers to help activate their predator instincts. That you um, referenced. But I just learned about this, um, I guess, this application within the last five or six days because I saw some handwritten signs. And that's really why I'm here today, just to uh, learn, get some more information about this application uh, because I, I care very much about the area. Um, so if this may have been addressed, and I apologize if this is repetitive, but just very simply, and perhaps the applicant can answer this question. Um, the, the current um, jellyfish building that's there now, is, is that is the um, proposed building uh, that the applicant wants to build, is that building higher than, uh, is the elevation higher than what's there now, or is it the same, or is it lower? So that would be a question that I have, because um, it's just not clear, it's not clear to me. Um, and then the, the other uh, point is really an observation because um, I know some people have mentioned about the traffic on 25A and it, it is a significant issue. I don't know how many cars this building will contribute to the area. Um, I know there's gonna be apartments and then uh, I guess a business on the uh, first floor, um, but obviously it's going to contribute cars into the area. And I understand the argument would be, so did a restaurant. Um, but I can speak to every day, um, I make a left off of Center Shore going eastbound on 25A, roughly during rush hour, every day. And it is not unusual at all to have the traffic that's going westbound on 25A to be backed up all the way to um, past the shack, and almost up to the Britannia, um, I don't know, whatever that is. I, to me, it's the marina. It was always the old Northport Marina. But um, that's a long way. That's, there are cars backed up all the way. And you have something similar um, at rush hour coming back. So I just think that's something that I understand may not be before you, but I just want to uh, echo some of the comments that I heard. I do have some concerns about um, additional traffic in the area for safety and just the general hassle of people getting around in Centerport. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Liz Berry. I'm a Huntington resident. I am up on Centerport Road at the top of the hill and came to support my Centerport friends. And a lot of what I was going to speak about has been spoken, uh, traffic. It is a very dangerous blind curve as you're heading west on 25A. I actually had an accident there uh, some years ago, and as the people have said, traffic has increased in volumes. Also, environmentally, I did read uh, some of the material posted on the website, on your website, that there's been no environmental uh, protection um, investigation. The eagle is another issue that I have to displace the eagles or disrupt their breeding habitat. And also, I wound up finding something that there was a proposal at uh, the chalet in 2003, an earlier proposal of a three-story building to replace the restaurant was rejected in two 2003. The village of Northport officials have joined some local homeowners in opposing the project, citing the strain it might cause to Northport sewerage treatment plant. Now we are in 2023, and there are probably a lot, there is a lot more strain on the sewer system. So that is of great concern. I swim in the harbor every day, 
and I can see the change of our water. This is just going to add to it. And I do find it interesting that you do pick a summer night. Some of my neighbors live on Haven Court, the Elriches, and I'm sure they wish they could be here. I think they're away on a trip like so many others, or you would probably have people down the road uh, just trying to get in to this meeting tonight. So I say no to more apartments. We don't need any more. We don't want any more in Huntington. We want to keep this the Huntington that we know. And lastly, apartment buildings or apartments, I'm sorry, not apartments, office. There are offices on Centerport Road at the Heron Park. I have seen a sign there forever for rent. Nobody's renting apartments. We don't need any more or any offices. We don't need any more office buildings in this area because they're not being rented. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Good evening. I'm Susan Weston. I live in Centerport. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank that was talked about earlier, I know we're all already past that, but in that shopping center, there's a perfectly empty store there, Models. If you drive around Huntington, you will see numerous empty stores, numerous, all over the place. Just drive down Jericho Turnpike. There's plenty of places that we can utilize instead of building new places. I think that we have, we have an aesthetic here in the town, in Centerport, in Huntington, that we need to keep. Does anyone even realize that there's a little park called Center Shore Park, right at Center Shore Road and 25A? That's a park there. There's a sign there. We don't know that. It doesn't even look like a park. Maybe we should just take, take down a building and build a park. Let's build a park instead of a parking lot like the song. Okay? So that's all I have to say. I think the traffic is very bad there. I have to wrench my neck to see traffic coming from the east. It's very bad. And I disagree with the attorney who said that the traffic will be less than having a restaurant there, because traffic's going to be there 24-7 now, not during restaurant hours. So it's only going to get worse. Now we have to watch traffic coming out 24-7 from that area and wrenching our necks to try to see the traffic coming from east. So it's a problem. I know this isn't the venue because you said we're here for certain topics, but I hope that you bring this to the planning board and to the planning staff. We really need a voice heard. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. My name is Linda Finnerty. I live at Hoover, 183 Hoover Place in Centerport. Um, I'd just like to say I don't think a park is a good idea because we're worried about the traffic and we're saying how dangerous it is on that road. I certainly wouldn't want kids of mine going down to the park on 25A. So I think that's a horrible idea. Jellyfish has been empty for a long time. The restaurants that were there before Jellyfish have failed over and over again. I don't know what the answer is to the property, but I think a, a lower use, which I think the apartments and a business would be than a restaurant, is certainly better than another restaurant or the, the mess that it is now. But please don't put a park in that section of 25A. It's a horribly congested area. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard regarding this application? Thank you everyone for your input. I'll ask Mr. McCarthy now to address the board in summary. Mr. Chairman, I'll just uh, rely upon the uh, opening remarks that I made and um, again reiterate for the board that we 
are making this application under Section 198.111 of the Code to rescind conditions that apply to a former Zoning Board of Appeals application. We are making an app request for this board's interpretive relief authority that the um, special use permit that was granted in 2011 for a parking lot continue as the parking lot continues. And under Section 198.109 is non applicable because it applies to special use permits and uh, we're not applying for a special use permit. And that's, those are my remarks. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. I'm going to declare the hearing is now closed and we will reserve decision. Thank you.